Nania and Nandini, maybe you can share a little bit about you. <clears throat> hey, hi, hi, Jose. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ananya. Um, I am based out of Bangalore, India, which is the southern part of the country. I'm working on uh, building a regenerative platform and economy for the creative manufacturing sector. And I'm also um, involved with the student uh, enterprise co-op, which is uh, with, with the other member from uh, platform co-ops. So yeah, thanks. Over to you, Nandini. Um, hi, I'm Nandini. I am also based out of Bangalore. Um, I am a designer and I work and uh, help run a design company in Bangalore. And we're exploring how we can shift to a cooperative model um, and make a design co-op um, or co-op that's at least that is that leverages uh, design. We're exploring. <laughs> the course is really um, um, expanding our boundaries with every session that me and my teammate have. Every session we are expanding what the co-op could really do. So it's, uh, it's actually pretty exciting. And we'll be able to hopefully test out uh, bits of it very soon. So good. Yeah. So from there we go to the, U to the US with Justin. Nope. Can't hear you, Justin. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm in Canada, by the way. Sorry about that. Uh, Hey, so what was the question? I came in late. No, we're just about, this is, as we are starting the disco party in just a few minutes, we're just showing who are the people who will be in the dance floor. Yep, I'm Justin. Uh, and my, uh, I'm a uh, designer of polyhedral lampshades, and I am building an app to help people uh, decorate those shapes, images, or cut hole patterns. And uh, I'm really interested in the disco structure for a global network of uh, polyhedral land producers and designers. Thank you, Justin. I don't know if anyone is willing, I think Sebastian, I think you were not in the previous call because I, I think that Roberto, Kimli, and Sari, you were already in the previous call in Spanish, right? So if you want to go next, Sebastian, and with this, we give the voice to, to Silvia and the whole disco team. So I am Sebastian from Belgium. Um, and I don't really know what more to say. <laughs> Just very curious. Let's call it to that. I'm a curious person, always. Okay, so I think we've waited for like uh, eight minutes. So uh, welcome everyone. I am super happy to be with you in this uh, second call in the English version of the, of the disco presentation. I think uh, uh, we were super lucky to have uh, the disco team with us in the first edition. And I think it writes so much interest and it's, and it's been mentioned for a couple of times in uh, different uh, talks and different uh, global calls in the in the different models. So I'm super happy that you guys managed to to make it in and and actually decided to share with us almost all your afternoon because if you take into consideration the both both sessions, it's just such an honor that you you're willing to to share your experience with you. I mean, I was I think that the previous session went super well. Um, and one thing I love is the honesty on which you share. Uh, also the things you know and your things you don't know and your experiments and everything. So I'm not even going to dare uh, try to introduce you guys. I think you do a much better job yourselves. <laughs> so I think Sylvia is going to run uh, the show mostly, but um, you have uh, a lot more of the, 
of the team uh, in your screens as well. So maybe if you want, before we start the whole conversation, maybe you want to just share who you guys are so everyone uh, knows that Irene, Taco, Silvia, Caitlin, are, you're there and you're not for just of the random crowd. Oh, and Matt over there, um, uh, just random people, but uh, part of the team. So um, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and uh, we're ready to start. Uh, just for everyone, uh, I'm recording this session. I will be uploaded uh, as always, but I just so you watch yourselves and see what you're saying. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead, Irene. Yes, hi. Just, I'm just want to say, I'm Irene. I don't want to take more time. It's very nice to see you all and look forward to all the questions that I'm sure you will have at the end of the session. All right. So, Silvia, if you want to start, maybe we can go through. I don't know if somebody you want to add something to that very short presentation. <laughs> OK. And welcome, everyone. Enjoy yourselves, and uh, let's begin. Okay, here we go. Let's just start by sharing the screen. So, hi everyone. Welcome to this English speaking session on Disco. Uh, we've been around for a while now, <laughs> but it's refreshing to see so many new faces and so many people who are interested in, in Disco. So, we are, um, just a second, I'm trying to navigate. Uh, can you see the presentation on the screen? Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's being shared, all right, okay. So my name is Silvia, Silvia Lopez. I'm a member of the DISCO team and also a member of the first DISCO or the first DISCO group, which is uh, Guerrilla Media Collective. I'm gonna, um, I'm going to clarify who's who in, in a minute. So welcome to the disco. Yay, we're on the dance floor. <laughs> and I don't know what discos are looking like, where you guys are located, but I'm in Barcelona, and this is what discos are like right now. Uh, <laughs> so welcome to the dance floor. We'll do what we can, move around. OK, so what's a disco? DISCO stands for Distributed Cooperative Organization. Organization and cooperative are easy. Maybe we can go a little bit into the distributed part. So this is, these uh, shapes are, you know, like the mirrors of the mirror ball. It's all DISCO themed. So in this little mirrors, what can we see? It's, uh, these are the concepts that have inspired our philosophy and the movements that we have learned so much from before uh, disco was even a thing or before it was called disco. So we can see the commons, um, the P2P governance, uh, free libre open source software, care work, value flows, we'll go into that later on too. Uh, just uh, rethinking about labor and workplaces and how people work together in general and feminist economics. So uh, what can we say? We are a group of people who work in collaborative ways, who work together and are enabled to work together thanks to technology because we all live in different places at DISCO and we are very conscious of the very important role, central role that technology is playing and will play in the next developments around how we work and how we work together as groups of people. And so discos are distributed cooperative organizations because they have a distributed structure. They are not centralized. Each one of us is connected to the others. And this is also a reference to distributed technologies as in, for example, distributed ledger technologies. So this is the kind of architecture that inspires us and also the type of technology that we want to advocate for. Uh, but maybe this is still a bit fizzy, so we are going to 
ask some of the question, what exactly is DISCO? Is it an organization? Is it just this group? Is, can anyone be in the DISCO? What is this about? So DISCO is a toolkit. It is a framework for people who want to work together while being mindful of the commons, that is to say, stewarding some common resources, being open source about their production, that is to say, open their knowledge, their infrastructure or their resources to a broader community, who are cooperative in the way that they work as a group, and who are distributed also in, the, in their use of technology. So basically, discos are something that we think will be relevant in the face of the big challenges of our time, the future of work and how are people going, are going, how are people going to work together in the networks? Are machines uh, going to replace us as workers? Are they going to replace all decision making? You know, as a translator, I was often asked uh, ever since I was studying still in the university, people would ask, uh, are you not afraid that you are going to be replaced by Google Translate soon? And when I was studying some years ago, like, I don't know, maybe eight years ago or six years ago, when I was still starting out as a translator, I would say, have you looked at the way Google Translate translates? Do you think that's acceptable? <laughs> I don't fear I'm going to be replaced anytime soon by this machine. But then Google Translate became a lot better and other uh, machine translations engines have become a lot better. So when people ask me nowadays if I'm afraid that I'm going to be replaced by Google Translate, what I answer is, I wish, I really hope that Google Translate takes away some kinds of translation from me so I can do the fun stuff, the intelligent stuff, the relevant stuff, the things that matter. And Google Translate can very well take care of repetitive tasks. And you know, this is a story of automation. This has happened with other kinds of work and is going to continue to happen. However, do we want machines also to make decisions for us? And DISCO was born also as a critique to DAOs, to decentralized autonomous organizations, which are organizations, uh, actually entities or more like a robot even, we can speak of it as the machine. And the machine is able to execute contracts, smart contracts are programmed into a DAO, and then a DAO can levy penalties, can execute all kinds of decision. And it has its upsides because it's, it can guarantee transactions, it can guarantee the fidelity of some of the things that are done on a network, but the all these uh, technology and many of the proponents of this kind of technology that is supposed to be disruptive are also stating that the best thing about DAOs is that they are trustless environments. And this is something that we think is problematic because we, do we really want to stop trusting each other as humans? So Disco questions this. And Disco also questions the fact that technology is always good just per se, just because it makes some things easier. Because technology is also not neutral. There is some human coding this machine. There is always some human interest also behind technology. So technology will always uh, reflect the preferences, the interests, or the bias, or the limitations of the people who are programming it, or of the people who are paying someone to program that for them. And in the spirit of critique of DAOs, we wanted to say we don't want a DAO, we want a cooperative organization, but DCO wasn't really, didn't sound that well. So 
instead of using decentralized cooperative organization just like that, the acronym became DISCO. And this is just to share that uh, the future, things that we say are the future of work and how technology are, is going to change our future, the future is actually the now in many cases. I came across this two days ago. Uh, this was published very recently and it says Spotify will let employees work from anywhere. They do best thinking and their best thinking and creating. So actually Spotify has decided to let their employees not only work from home, uh, wherever they were located before, but even work from a different city. And I don't know, this. I saw this being shared in, you know, social media, and I was really unimpressed by this decision because this is how we've been functioning at Disco and at Guerrilla Media Collective for years. So I was really, I saw this and I was so what? Like everyone can do that right now at any given moment with the right tools and with the right organizational practices. This is the team that has been working like the Spotify employees will be able to work soon in the future. We have been doing this for years. This is a picture of the Guerrilla Media Collective, which is the group that worked in the first versions of the disco governance model of the soon to be disco organizational form and tools. So you can see some of the people who are also present in this call, like Anne-Marie, Stako, Sari, Timothy, Lara, Rona, and myself. This was taken in the west of Spain in a small village in the mountains called Hervas. And this was actually the last in-person meeting I was able to attend which was already a while ago. We have a collective that is called Guerrilla Translation. And before Disco became its own thing, we developed this governance model that we were trying to apply to ourselves while we were developing this. It's called dog feeding. <laughs> this is like, a running joke in our organization. We are constantly just feeding, feeding ourselves, feeding ourselves our own stuff, feeding ourselves the model. So what is Guerrilla Translation? Originally, and it still is, it's a translation collective that is best known for the materials we have on our web page. We have an online uh, site with articles. And what's special about this is that we curate the content ourselves. So we see a text, uh, we have a bilingual page. So there's the Spanish version and the English version. In this case, this is the English uh, language page. And so the way it works is that our translators, we work uh, obviously on commission. So someone wants to have something translated, they come to us or they want subtitles or some kind of translation service uh so to say in the lsp in the language services uh, market and they come to us so this is that's too soon for that and uh, however we also have this translingual knowledge commons where we pick the resources that we want to share with other people we come across articles and texts that we think people should be reading and although there is no one who's interested in this uh, from a market point of view. There is no one maybe interested in paying us to translate it, this article or publishing it anywhere. However, we think this is something worthy and this is some ideas that we would like to share. So what do we do? We contact the author, we translate it ourselves pro bono and we publish it. We share it with CC with Creative Commons licenses as well. And we try to circulate the text. We try to share these resources. Uh, yes, Guerrilla Media Collective is still functioning. It's just that it's now, I just saw a question in the chat. Guerrilla Translation is very much well, uh, alive and well, and we are still publishing articles. Uh, 
However, some of us are part of both Guerrilla Media Collective and the team that is developing DISCO. So these two entities that once were one are now two overlapping teams. Um, this is a workshop that we did as Guerrilla Media Collective about the DISCO model, the DISCO governance model. Here we are thinking and brainstorming. And the cool thing about DISCO is that it's a model that was first applied to this translation collective, but it can actually be applied to any economic activity, any kind of group. These are our collective portraits that we did in our session. This is a very cool dynamic. You can see every portrait was drawn by the rest of the group. One person did the hair, one person did the eyes, one person did the mouth, and one person did the rest of the body. Oops, sorry. So this is part of the people who are in the disco, but who else is in the disco? Or rather, who is the who, sorry, I was on mute. Who, who is the disco team now? Well, there's a lot of people in the dance floor. This is the complete, or almost complete uh, constellation of the disco team. It includes people from Guerrilla Media Collective, but also its own dedicated, committed members who are working on developing disco and members of our sister collectives, Geeks Without Bounds and Mycorrhizal Software, who are working with us on the on the technical and the software part, because Disco aims to offer a set of tools to people who wish to work together in collaborative ways. Culture tools and also technological tools, a structure that supports these practices in the form of open source software that we are developing. Okay, so what is exactly this go now you have seen the faces of the team you've seen where it comes from but what is it exactly that we are trying to show you here well um as i was saying before it is something that we think is relevant with the recent developments of technology automatization the future of work the challenges but it is i mean it would be too presumptuous to say it is the answer to all the big challenges we are facing. Of course, we can say that. However, we want to offer some tools so that each group of people can find their solutions with the practices that we've been applying on ourselves and that we think work or have worked for us in some way. And we are still working on making them better. And this goes DNA draws greatly from these four movements, the commons, that are systems that steward some resource that regulate the access uh, so that resource is not depleted. Uh, you may be familiar with Eleanor Ostrom's work. She uh, analyzed, for example, some fisheries in Turkey where the fishermen regulated themselves and regulated the access to the fisheries so that this resource would not be depleted in absence of a mechanism from the state that could protect the resources. So they actually, they reach a system of agreements between themselves so that everyone could benefit from this shared wealth, from this shared resource without damaging it, without depleting it. Um, open co-ops are cooperatives that add a layer of opening up the resources in the same manner as open, open source communities and, or open source software also shares their resources, their knowledge and their work. Open value accounting is one of the challenging aspects of our model because it requires that we rethink so many of the ways that we think around wage labor work how we value work how we remunerate how we compensate one thing we do or another kind of thing we do and this ties in with the next discipline which is or movement which is feminist economics because we 
also think that care work is work and some of the invisible work includes not only caring for the health of the organization, but also caring for the humans in it. And this becomes uh, more and more relevant as we try to take care of each other also from a distance because we are a distributed team and we are so far away from one another. So these are the four major influences that have contributed to shaping disco. So now we can see where we come from and how we aim to offer the disco principles. Here are the seven traditional cooperative principles. These are the seven classic principles. You're surely familiar with them. Disco also has its principles, but we try to incorporate all these influences from the open source communities, from the um, open cooperative movement, from feminist economics and from the commons. So in this diagram, we can see how we add layers to cooperatives. In classic co-ops, what's uh, important about them is that they are worker owned and also controlled by the workers. Platform co-ops, you probably know all about them by now after the course, um, add a layer because they have a web interface, they have an app, they, or some of some to some extent their activity takes place in a digital space. So we're talking about a digital platform to it and a digital economy. Open co-ops also may be uh, carrying out their activities in a digital space, but what's important about them is that they are open source. They aim to open their practices or the tools that they develop or the resources that they are creating with a wider community. And they are oriented towards social goals. So they are oriented towards the common good and they are oriented towards this uh, commons that we were talking about. They are trying to protect, to care for and steward a common wealth and a common resource that can be or may be, whoops, may be accessed by different kinds of people who may or may not be in the disco. And we'll see more about this uh, later. So these are the seven disco principles. They, we, they are our proposal, heavily inspired, of course, of the seven original cooperative principles, but that add layers to them because they draw on all these influences that we've been looking at. Uh, so we are going to actually talk a little bit about each and every one of these seven principles, but we are going to use the lived experience of the disco labs because Guerrilla Media is not the only group applying disco to itself right now. And well, there is also the disco team um, here you can see the different groups, so it becomes a little bit easier. So at, in the bottom, in the cent at the center, there is this big red ball, half spaceship, half disco ball. And this is our own group, disco.coop, the people who are developing the model, the people who are carrying out the disco project, the people who are working on the software development. development. This is disco. Bottom left is Guerrilla Media Collective, which we've also already seen. So it's this, um, in a way, or disco because it was the first group that applied the model to itself and contributed to its development. But in a, in another sense, its only activity is not. I mean. Developing Disco is not its only activity anymore. And there's a dedicated group to developing Disco. So Guerrilla Media Collective still is a translation collective that functions as a Disco and tries to apply the Disco model as 
uh, in the best possible way to itself. But we have other groups. We have had other people come to us and say, hey, I like what you're doing. I think this model could be useful for, for our group. And this is actually what we want. We want people. Sorry, I mean, I think I should stop just touching the computer <laughs> because I just muted myself accidentally. Sorry. Uh, we've had a lot of people. There's a lot of enthusiasm around Disco. And as I was saying before I muted myself, <laughs> A lot of people just came to us and said, I really like what you guys are doing. If this is what you're doing, we want to try it too. And because it, everything is still at such an experimental stage, they are the disco labs. And the first lab, so top left, is multi-talented makerspace. It's a makerspace located in Zimbabwe. We have Laneras, who are a group of artisans. They work with uh, merino wool, which is a traditional kind of sheep's wool in Spain. And they also uh, apply traditional techniques then to the wool. They create different wool products. Um, everything is handmade and they also try to educate the community about the wool and the sheep and the ecosystem of, of these. Uh, there is Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, which is actually a federation of different co-ops with different functions. And there is Tasebais in the Basque country, who are an innovation group, and they are our most recent disco acquisition. We are very happy to be working with them. And these groups are already living disco principles or some of them to some extent and this is what we are going to look at right now so the first uh, group is the values based accountability discos are statutorily oriented to, uh, towards the common good and this means that from the start in their bylaws or in their statutes in whatever legal documents they have in whatever mission or vision statements they may produce. They state explicitly that they are working towards the common good. They are not profit driven. They are not interested in producing uh, mass, uh, massively uh, some products. Oh, stop this screen. <laughs> Sorry. I. You know what? It's because I'm trying to see a maximum of faces because I want to see you guys. But then I end up clicking on myself and muting myself. <laughs> there you are. Okay, I just found a better layout to stop muting myself. Sorry for the distraction. So all discos just basically state from the start in their most official documents, this is what we want to do. We just, just, just don't want to create and produce stuff to sell it. We actually want to work on a need, a need that we may have it identified in our environment, in our nearest community, or in a broader community, but this is what we want to do. We want to work needs-based towards the common good. And we, in doing so, we might address social challenges or environmental challenges. And if we look back at the labs, we can very easily identify what challenges, for example, Cooperation Jackson may be addressing. Or when I was talking about the Laneras, they are also stewarding this environmental resource with the biodiversity and the merino sheep that they are, um, that they have. In the case of Guerilla Media Collective, it's also very easy to identify that we are trying to build a translingual knowledge commons. We are translating materials that other people might not be interested in, you know, commissioning, but we think this should be shared and we are putting this resource also at avail we are making it available to the community. These are the Laneras who are fantastic. And I picked them as an example just to show that it is possible to apply this code to any context. This is, for example, a group that is active with traditional art 
artisan techniques in a rural area and they actually have a very broad project because they not all, not only do they make wool products but they also they want to open up a space where they can educate the community uh also about this ancient this uh all these ancient wool making techniques and they want to open their space to others so they can also work in they can also do things in their workshop it's a very exciting project the second disco principle is building whole community governance that is to say discos are multi-stakeholder and in this way we are not only leaving our decision-making processes inside the organization. Instead, we are trying to be open and include more people in our decision-making processes. This may be financial backers, people who are supporting us in some way. People may be supporting us also through their work or through their involvement in some form, even though they are not really part of the team. And we also want to include them. It might be the neighboring communities or people who are affected by the work at DISCO does. It can also be other agents, other stakeholders in their supply chain, suppliers, clients, people who are in close contact with the organization, and also those people who perform effective and reproductive labor. So people who are behind the scenes, but, you know, without them, maybe the organization couldn't really be, wouldn't really be able to function and to perform their commercial, their more um, like open economic activity. So this goes try to include all these stakeholders that are maybe not part of the core team that are maybe not strictly, you know, in a traditional cooperative, you have the assembly of the workers. This goes try to make that a little bit more open and more broad. Discos by default are also active creators of commons. This means they generate decommodified open access resources. For example, in the case of Guerrilla, you can read the, the articles. So it's a very it's very easy to identify our comments. In the case of the multi-talented makerspace, they are also offering this infrastructure to others. So this is a commons that can be physical, can be something tangible as well. And anything can be a commons, actually. It can be a natural resource that you try to um, protect as uh, and at the same time, allow people to access it and to benefit from it. And it can also be documentation. So, for example, we all know cases like Wikipedia or the Creative Commons licenses. You basically, you can share, and especially with technology, it's just so easy to share um, all these resources. So, best practices is documentation. This is what we do at Disco. We just we talk a lot and then we write it down and we put it up on the internet and it sounds easy when we say it like that but this is actually the way we came to develop this this framework this model that we know think could be useful for other people and obviously also the code so when we have the software ready to use it will also be open the next DISCO principle is rethinking global and local economies. So physical production is kept local, while knowledge, resources and values or code or written best practices and documentation are shared globally. So, for example, something we did at Guerrilla Translation a while ago is organize a Think Global Print Local campaign. We coordinated and did the Spanish language translation of the book Think Like a Commoner by David Bollier. And instead of having one Spanish or one Spain based publisher print all of the books and then send them over to Argentina, Chile, Mexico, 
with the environmental impact that these practices have, what we did was coordinate a network of publishers that then distributed the book locally. So Guerrilla Translation uh, translated the English text and we gave them a print ready file, but then the book was printed locally in each one of the countries. So the distribution was also kept at the local level. And we advocate for this mode of production. And this is also something that we see in the maker spaces in the makers community. Something we saw, for example, and that many people in Spain have heard about when the when we had the hardest lockdown phase last year and not everyone could access face masks because there was a, a shortage of face masks uh, almost a year ago when in the peak of the first wave of the pandemic. In this moment, the maker community united themselves, they coordinated themselves uh, and everyone was locked down. So that meant that each person was in their home. But people who had 3D printers and the resources to do that just started sharing designs. Lots of people printed, you know, these little plastic pieces that allow you to fix your masks without fixing it to your ears. So it eases the, the strain on your ears. And they distributed this to to hospitals, to healthcare professionals. And this is something that happens spontaneously, but it is exactly the mode of production that we are um, that we are stating in this disco principle. This is something that can happen and could should happen more, actually, the way we see it, because these open source designs were just shared freely and then it was also a lot more effective. It could get to more people quickly. Uh, this is our core principle. All of the principles are important, but care work is really key to us. It is also the principle that makes us uh, question ourselves a lot more and question our practices as a group. and. It, we are always learning. Um, I just said the disco labs are testing grounds. We are experimenting with the model still as we are developing. So again, practicing on ourselves, feeding it to ourselves. But uh, in this principle, uh, I think we've had to rethink a lot of our assumptions around work and around what it means to 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 uh, care for each other in a group. So we have also a special definition of care work, somewhat broad definition of care work, because for us, care work is twofold. We care for each one of our members in the group. For example, we have community rhythms that include a dedicated channel where everyone checks in daily or at their the idea is to do it daily, even though sometimes if you don't feel up to it, it's not really a constraint. So we check in saying how we are feeling today. And this creates a space in the community that also allows other people to ask. Because if I go on my daily check-in and I say, hmm, you know, honestly, today I'm doing not so great, then someone else in the team is going to write to me at some point, they'll write me a message or call me to check on me. So this is something that as a distributed team, because we don't share physical spaces, we have to enable these spaces where trust is built, where interpersonal relationships progress, and we have the possibility to care for each other as humans. However, care work is also caring for the health of the organization. And this means caring for the group dynamics and the health of the collective, but also it includes some kinds of administrative tasks, some kinds of organizational project management kind of tasks, we also include that in our definition of care work, 
and we often have a metaphor that is a shared flat. This is a comic that became very popular some years ago. The text is in French, but fear not because I am a translator. So I'm going to walk you through the text. Uh, so you can see how the housework analogy applies to our work and to our care work in disco. And it would apply in any given disco. So this comic is uh, originally about the mental charge and this female, this girl, this female character just said, you know, when I try to do something very simple in the house, such as cleaning the table, I go to the table, I pick out some random object that is laying on the table because I need to clear it in order to clean it. And as I'm walking with this object, I just stumble upon some piece of clothing or some towel, which is laying on the ground. So I pause all this other thing that I'm doing. I leave the table B, I pick up this towel, I take it to the laundry basket, but when I get to the laundry basket, I see that the laundry basket is full. And because I am conscious, of the needs of everyone living in this household and I see that the laundry basket is full and that someone will need to use the laundry basket or the clothes in it at some point, what do I do? I forget about the table once again, I put the towel in the laundry basket, I take the laundry basket with me and I do the laundry because it will make life easier for the other people who are in this household. Well, it is actually the same with our digital tools in our daily work. For example, I have to answer an email because someone asked something. Someone wrote, someone got in touch with Disco, or as a guerrilla translator, someone wants a budget because they want to have something translated. So we get an email query and someone has to reply to this email, someone from the team. Let's say I'm going to do it. I see the inbox. Okay, there is some things we need to clarify about this particular query or about this particular project. So what do I do? I go to the instant messaging tools, Slack, Mattermost, others. And I get in touch with the team because I want to double check so because there's someone who may not disperse may know this person or may know this type of project. They may be more familiar with some aspects of it. So I get in touch with the team. And then someone says, oh yeah, sure, but have you checked the Lumio card on this pre on the previous iteration of this project or on the previous thing we did for this person? So I go to the, not Lumio, I think I said Lumio, the Trello to the project management tool. It can be Trello, Asana, any kind of, you know, Kanban board style or to-do list that is shared, any shared resource where you say, this is the things that we have to do. This is the deadline that we have. So I go to the Trello board and I see that maybe there's a missing link or a broken link, or there's a checklist, there's, you know, a to-do list and there are things that have been done but they haven't been crossed out. The deadline is not up to date. This is, it says here that this is due last week, but we are on this week and there's still things to do. So obviously we need to update the deadline. And there's some person missing that they have to work in this task, but someone needs to tag them because otherwise they will never see this. What do I do? I forget about my email and I start updating the Trello card because it will make the life easier for the next person because the next, the next person, when they access the common board, they will know what to do. And then when I'm doing this, I realize that, oh, there's a decision that we need to make as a team. So what do I do? Uh, I still leave my email somewhere in the back of my head and I go to our decision-making space, which in this case is Lumio, but it could be anything or it could be jumping on a call or going to the calendar and scheduling a call so we can talk about something or agree on something. So this is why our definition of care work includes also all these little things, because if we were in a flat, this would be our laundry basket. And this is how we take care of each other as well. We just make things a little bit easier for each one of us so everyone knows what they have to do. 
this is another challenging point of our model, of our proposal, of our tools, and it ties in very well with what we were saying about care work and with what with something else we've been talking about before, which is the commons. We've been uh, saying that we want to value all types of work, that we want to honor all contributions to the team, and that without care work, the other type of work just wouldn't be possible because someone has to answer that email, otherwise we won't get the translation, for example. So what we try to say in this DISCO principle is that not with the previous example, not only the translation itself is valuable, uh, obviously not. People know us because we have a website with a lot of articles that have been done pro bono. Someone did that. Maybe they did it a long time ago, but it is work as well. So what we try to do is to track all contributions that are done, not only the ones that have an explicit market value, but actually all contributions are valuable and all are counted, so to say, in our system. So we have livelihood work is the term for market value work, commission, work on commission, work that other people hire us to do. Uh, love work is the commons creative value. So this is something we want to offer a community some resource that we want to share with other people and that we do voluntarily in many cases. And then there's the care work, the dishes, the laundry, the emails, the, you know, all three of them are important. And even though, and all three of them actually bring the money in, it's just that only one of them has the price tag but all three are required, so the money flows in. And this is really important, and we acknowledge this, and then just try to make it explicit and codify it, and we have a plethora of Excel sheets to make this explicit and to make it accessible so we can have conversations about how do we distribute uh, the resources that we have, taking into account the different contributions. It's complicated, but it's a really important part of our model. It's complicated now, but hopefully it will get easy in the future. Since this is what the software that we are developing is meant to do. Um, uh, one part of the software tools that we are developing at Disco is the value tracking tool, the Disco deck. And here we have the deck like in the Disco, which is just one way to visualize it, but you can visualize it in many ways. You know, you have these three value streams that we have determined. They can be, you know, buckets that fill each other. You can visualize it as an abacus, it can be a graph. It will probably be a it will probably be a graph at some point in the actual software. The point is, we try to make the economics accessible, and we try to make the financial conversations and the economic conversations accessible to people who may not feel comfortable looking at an Excel sheet for this information. So what we do is we try to make it visual, we try to make it apparent, just to enable the group conversations and then have to happen. Because when, uh, is, when we pay each one of the three types of value, when is each stream paid out, at which rate, in which quantity, to which person, why one why one more than the other or why this before that? These are the conversations that the humans have to have. This is why we don't really believe that a DAO would solve every organization's problems. What we need is the possibility to have honest and informed conversations to then make decisions. And the disco deck will be a great tool for that.
We are working on the disco deck with our sister collective Geeks Without Bounds and also Mycorrhizal software. Here you can see Lynn. Uh, she's part of Mycorrhizal software and she works with a methodology, a vocabulary that is called value flows. It is one of the parts of the disco deck. And this is something we are uh, very, uh, I think we are just very much looking forward to having the disco deck as well, because again, we are trying this on ourselves without the disco deck. So we are doing it manually with a set of, you know, shared documents and having all these tough conversations about what is what. And it is a very exciting process, but we're especially very excited to see some results on the on the disco deck, on the software. Everyone is keeps saying, oh, when we have the software, this will be a lot easier. But we are doing the previous work that the software requires of course. So this is what we're doing. And so we come to the last uh, principle, which is that discos by default are prime for federation. Our ultimate objective is taking over the world. Just basically, <laughs> we want discos everywhere. <laughs> this is what we want. Uh, because we think it's it's obviously like a very valid format and it could, it could actually suit any group anywhere and with this in mind that we want to take over the world discos have a federation protocol so they can connect with other discos one thing about this is also that a single disco shouldn't get too big because if there's too many people in the disco it's difficult to build the interpersonal relationships it's difficult to maintain the patterns of care among members of mutual support, it's difficult to build the trust necessary to make some decisions together and to apply some of the decisions. And because of that, we have a federation protocol. I think each disco should be between 15, 20 people max. But if the group gets larger, they should probably just become two nodes that stay connected, that still work together, still interact. Also remember, discos are multi-stakeholder. So one node of a disco can be a stakeholder in another disco and they can collaborate in many ways and stay connected. But at the same time, this allows us to the, this allows us to keep groups that are manageable, that are capable of building trust and uh, by federating, we can then scale the potential of discos. Uh, so, for example, Cooperation Jackson is already a federation. And in the case of Disco and Guerrilla Media Collective, they are actually two nodes of a disco. They are very close together also because in this case, some team members are overlapping. But the idea is that they will be two nodes interacting very close together. Also, Guerrilla Media Collective has a Guerrilla Graphic Collective node, the Guerrilla Coding Collective. We are cultivating all these relationships and best case scenario, each one of these groups that are, you know, very interested in what we do and who are very keen on uh, this principles, this philosophy, this way of working together as a group will just end up being one more disco. And this is the latest document that we've published recently, uh, just before Christmas, we got it out. We have the Disco Manifesto online in disco.coop and then the Disco Elements. The Disco Manifesto is basically uh, why we need discos all over the place, but in 90 pages, <laughs> with additional context on some of the influences uh, that I've been talking about the in at the start of our call and talking more about the blockchain space and the DAOs and why we think a, a technological a cooperative oriented alter, commons oriented alternative is necessary. The Disco Elements is a much more detailed, better version of this talk because we go through 
the seven principles. We have a chapter for each one of them. We incorporate the case uh, of one of the labs or two of the labs, and we share their lived experience. And it's available on our site, so uh, you can you can access it. There is a third paper, a third document to be published uh, soon, which is the. We're not doing a white paper because we prefer to do a pink paper. So the technical document, <laughs> which is called the pink paper, uh, will be published also soon this spring. And with a future hopefully, hopefully full of discos and many disco balls in the horizon, I get to the end of this talk. Um, I hope it was a good introduction to discos. It's been difficult to fill in the shoes of uh, Stacco and Marie, some of our more experienced disco speakers. And I've also been here <laughs> since forever because I did the Spanish language one. <laughs> so I've drunk a lot less water than I've been needing to. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to see your faces and also uh, uh, I have now this big gallery view. So thank you for being here. Thanks for your interest in disco and your enthusiasm in some cases. And if you have comments or questions, uh, there is not only me, there's also more team members, but I'll be very happy to, to answer whatever questions you may have. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, there was a moment when I was so sure that you were going to say, when there's too many people in the disco, you can't dance uh, instead of like... <laughs> but you know, this experience has been erased. It's been like a year since I was I last, <laughs> since I was in a disco for, for the last time. You're but you're that. completely right. <laughs> We were talking about that with my friends. I miss when people were like pushing me around the disco. And, uh, you know, just like, uh, yeah, bump into you. I miss that too. <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation. I think um, this was super. Um, I'm so happy that that we you got to share this. And um, I think Eden has been answering uh, to some comments on the chat, but um, I, I noticed that there are some people that raise uh, some questions, but please feel free to uh, share out loud. So if you want to, um, maybe unshare the screen so we can see everyone, and then um, and then just feel free to to pop up and and just uh, speak up. So we know this is not a shy group, so it's not the time to appear. So people, it's not the time to appear. So okay, I'm just I'm catching up with the chat now because I was you know trying to not mute myself all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and looking at the slides, I wasn't really just, but um, thanks for the questions. I'm trying to, if someone wants to, to take the floor now, that would be great too. Otherwise we, we keep looking into the chat. Otherwise I'll, otherwise I'll start. So please do, do, do come up because if not, I'll start. I, I have a question. Go, um, go Jennifer. How did you guys fund the disco deck? I know you, so you have the translation how did you fund the the basically the disco and the disco deck? So at the moment we um, we are in the middle of a project funded by a grant for the web, which is a consortium with Mozilla and Coil and different organizations. We were awarded one grant for developing the cultural resources of disco. So we have, for example, the disco elements out, there's a disco wiki. Geeks Without Bounds got another grant mm -hmm. and they are helping us. We are working together on the first versions on the pre previous work and the early stages of development of the disco deck. We are trying to get more funding so we can continue. Nice. Great. Thank this you. is what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah. very similar. Can I go next? Yeah. yeah sure. Anania? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to get you the floor. Yeah. Very similar question. Just um, in addition, how my, I was thinking, how do you um, 
create these resources and toolkits in the sense like how do you capture the best practices in the industry? With, are there any uh, specific process of documentation? Do you co-create these processes with the stakeholders of uh, DISCO? And when I say DISCO stakeholders, who are, who are these communities? Are they communities who are, who are only members of DISCO or are they, are they part of, um, they could be part of any other organization or platform and yet interested in be and, you know, uh, be connected and co-create this entire journey with them? That was my question, thanks. Sorry, I think you're on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was looking for it again. I, I hit the mute button so well that now I couldn't find it. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for your comments and thanks for your question. So we have different uh, protocols. We have on the one hand the community rhythms where we review. Uh, for example, we have you know, normal communication rhythms just to keep going and to coordinate as a group. But then we also have a more reflective uh, rhythm, which is the quarterly review. And as a result of this review every quarter, we then have a lot of takeaways and we usually uh, just have a lot of homework after the, the, qu the quarterly review. There's a lot of, you know, things that become apparent because also sometimes things become more apparent in hindsight. So when we look back on the previous quarter, on the previous couple of months, three months, then we can see patterns or we can see some some of the problems we've had made or some of the solutions or some of the things we've managed to to you know get better at and then we we have a document and usually that becomes maybe a lumio discussion if there's uh, decisions to be made or it goes into the wiki we have a wiki and we have to do to update the wiki on a regular basis because in disco.coop the project is the documentation itself in many ways i mean it's not the only part of the project but it's certainly a very important one because we are testing the governance model every day and so we have things that we are porting for the from the older stages from the older guerrilla media model that we are still applying and we are right now mm, revising improving and just porting into the disco wiki new developments uh i think my teammates are here so <laughs> in case i'm saying nonsense they can they may unmute themselves but i think for example these quarterly reviews are very insightful for us and they allow us to then proceed to document the things we've been observing in our group does this answer more or less your yeah. question yeah thanks thanks so much uh, thank you so just much a little bit uh who would be an ideal disco community oh Is yes uh multi-stakeholders so we have for example on this if you know the platform we have lumio to make decisions and lumio has the possibility of making of inviting people to threads so we have our team threads where we discuss make decisions vote but we have also open threads where we invite other people to participate to chime in to and we take their their insights into account Sometimes we just set up a call uh, but with someone with, a, I don't know, maybe someone who represents another collective who would be interested and then we just take notes. Uh, sometimes, for example, we've tried to invite people to participate on Lumio, but this might not be the most comfortable for everyone because of the format. Um, but we try to be open about it. I see in the chat that Anne-Marie has a comment. Anne-Marie is also part, part of the Disco team. So when you want. Whoops. <laughs> I didn't unmute, but I folded myself. What an intro. Hey, you're huh? looking, you do look like you're in a Disco. Yeah, we've, we've lit the, the studio. 
Yeah, yeah you guys are great. Account. So you're in full we've, 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 I can only yeah, do this. <laughs> 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 well done. I wanted to address something uh, that I heard in the question, but mm -hmm. I think that it's probably important to say that our relationship with external communities who are beginning the process of taking on some work in incorporating disco principles and practices is extremely new. And so even having the opportunity to get feedback from those communities is, is still a little bit, I don't want to say premature, but it's an early process. So for anyone to adapt any principles and give us feedback, this is what we're doing now. We're trying to help people understand how to incorporate and modify where necessary. I don't think that we can um, say we've got an very far with that yet, but I do think that everyone involved understands that the process is going to be collaborative long term with those communities as long as they're interested, and that their feedback is the whole point, and that their stakeholdership is the whole point, because we won't be able to uh, develop a, or help develop other types of discos unless we get that input. So this is the moment and anyone here present who can think of any application for these principles and work that they're doing or any communities that they're adjacent to that would be a really great thing to know um, including how to help support that work so thanks for the answer opportunity thanks that answers my questions thanks i if no one has a question i do have a question <laughs> I was no. going to pick up on something from the chat, but if okay, you ahead, want to make a question. I, um, I saw a, a question for from Justin, one of the latest questions that were made in the chat, which is, is all work that isn't directed as a, at a particular gig considered care work, though? No, we also have the love work. For example, in disco.coop, the love work is uh, guiding the labs mostly, although part of that is also un filed under livelihood, so to say, because it can be uh, it can be included as part of funded project deliverables. Ah, okay, so self-chosen gigs are also gigs. Okay. So then all work that is not part of a gig, I, I would probably say is care work, but I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you want to elaborate? Yeah, uh, it just seems like there's just so much like little administrative tasks and that kind of con flicks with my idea of care work as like nurturing the human aspect of the organization like they're kind of like can be soul-sucking tasks sometimes so it just feels weird to call it care work okay thanks i totally get your point and for us care work is nurturing the group and making everyone feel comfortable and checking on others so we can actually take care of each other and supporting each other also at a personal level because we have these trusts relation trust relationships that develop i would argue though that doing the soul sucking tasks is care work for other people so there is not only one person doing soul sucking tasks <laughs> that yes. is can Absolutely, <laughs> care work. Okay, okay so, yeah, I get it. Mind? It's like, for example, uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, um, sorry. I, I was going to jump in after you after you finish your question. I can actually further a little bit about the human relationship stuff too, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. No, no, but is it Justin? You had a little something more to say. I, I just wanted to say it makes total sense. Like, for example, uh, it, by reducing technical debt of a software project, you're making the workers' lives easier in the future uh, so they don't have to deal with all the baggage. Uh, so Right on. Well, let me just tell you something else, though, which is that I think that um, 
it's hard to describe in a presentation how much contact we have with each other and how much of a relationship building process there is. When someone enters the collective or collectives, there's a dating process, which is our metaphor for, you know, you have to invest a little time before we really know you, before we understand how the trust relationship works, if we all feel a fit. And in that time, there's a, a real lot of time spent uh, understanding where people are at. We have a daily process of a daily check-in, knowing, kind of taking the temperature of people's state, mentoring each other in the practices of the actual work, but also having a kind of point person for mutual support who is not the same as the mentor, who can help with even conflict resolution. We're going through some of that right now. And so there's, there's a lot of relationship uh, oriented stuff among people, among small groups, working circles. There's a lot of care for individuals in the collective and we extend that outward. We're always so surprised when someone uh, comes from a different environment because we're a bit shocked back into the greater reality because we really do care for each other. And that's encoded in our practices and mutual support. And we, we have a lot of things written about care before code, and caring for the, the humans. The administrative or other kind of crappy tasks that you're talking about, they are, they're more visible um, and they're, they're kind of easier to imagine. But we're a very bonded group. And, um, and that's as a result of the time we've put in. So just wanted to make sure that that was clear and available and I'm muting. I was trying to reply to another question in the sh in the chat, which came up because I also think it's very interesting. So if no one wants to chime in right now, we can maybe address that, which is Tom, Tom's question. Is it explicit in design that you are trying to avoid the development of an administrative or managerial organizational case? I would say so. Um, the other disconnects here present can uh, maybe also agree or chime in. The very uh, underlying idea is that care work should be distributed, just like I'm gonna, I don't know, I could share the comic again, just that in a house, everyone should be able to, maybe not do it every day, but everyone should be able to, you know, do things like the laundry, the dishes, and the fact of, ta of taking care um, and taking care <laughs> is actually the word, uh, taking care of these things, of these tasks, uh, means that you're taking more responsibility and that eventually translates in more power. At the same time, as Justin said, some of those tasks are soul sucking, so they can also get frustrating. The best way to address both burnout and power imbalance is distributing the care work among the members. This is what we try to do. Uh, we have in our many <laughs> spreadsheets and trial formulas and the pre-work that we are doing that we will then feed into the deck is um, a formula that calculates the average care work performed by the members. Uh, so basically, if you did the same amount of care work as any as everyone else, or to put it another way, if we take all the care work that has been done and divide it equally by each by all the members, then how much care work should each person do? If you've done more, then you're taking on more weight, and if you're done less, then we might want to see why. Is it because you couldn't? Is it because you didn't want to? Is it because you're specialized in another tasks? This is why we are so eager to have the deck because we will be able to visualize and see at a glance where an imbalance is occurring and then have the discussion about the power or the responsibility or the burnout or whatever group decisions need to be made in that regard. If, if I could. Um... Like, I, I kind of get how something like this would work at the level of, like, a freelancer hive, especially if you're able to keep, like, the total cost of administration, management, but also internal reproductive labor below, like, 25%. But, like, that's probably going to be quite challenging to begin with. Uh, but, like, my own interests are less 
in that sort of like freelancer class. I'm more interested in the integration of people who have like intellectual and physical disabilities. So I was kind of wondering if this was something you'd given like any thought to or if it had ever come up. Um, it's also because like, uh, like I get and I like a lot of this, the same as I liked Better Means like 10 years ago. But could you tell me what this is like I'm like eight, 10 years old? Thanks for for do, expanding, uh, Tom. I think it's really interesting what you're saying. So basically, if I'm getting it, if I'm like going, getting what you say, hearing it, I'm passing it through the disco filter and explaining it with disco words, your main activity is already care. Uh, my criticism is mm -hmm. I think that this system looks very nice, for kind of kind of hipster nerds who like love this shit to begin with, if I can put it that way. Yeah, for um, sure. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I'm wondering about applications of it outside of that because that's a really small bubble of people, and it it kind of seems like a mm, I don't want to say a cartel of you know a few of us, but I, I want to know where the broader social benefit is. Because you're saying we could apply this to anything. So I'm trying to think how it could work for people who, who don't have our privileges, who aren't the work from home class, you know, that whole piece. Uh, especially because, like, you said social and solidarity economy. And I've seen a whole load of opposition in social and so in solidarity economy, especially to the idea of quantifying reproductive labor. It's like a lot of people actually think it's counter ideological. It's emotionally bad because it gets it means you're basically marketizing a whole load of what otherwise are no, things we don't think about as part of the market. You know, the same way you don't with your friends calculate how much how much flour they took out of the kitchen or something, because then then you're in a different mentality where it's all about calculation, all about rationality, and like that total like utility function thing. And a lot of people, and even I'm really uncomfortable with that, because I don't like to think about the things I do for love being measured that way. Has that come up at all? Hey, Sylvia, I can also... I can see some thing. of my fellow disconouts raising their hands. So because I've been talking for a long while, I will yeah. let them go ahead. Yeah, yeah if you don't you mind, mind. I, I'd kind of like to relieve you of some of this and also say that there's a lot that came up. Yeah, yeah. yeah there you go. Uh, oh, maybe you just before, I do want to say one thing, which is thanks again. <laughs> like, I really appreciate these kind of comments because they are already making me think of the way we think about things. But yeah, now, Anne-Marie? For sure. I saw also Irene and Caitlin, so. I'll um... be short then, I'll be short. Maybe other people would like to chime in. I want to say that there's a whole lot in that, it wasn't even really a question. It was almost like opening several conversations. And I think that there are several really good conversations there, really meaningful ones to us. I would, I would try to condense this and then pass the mic to say that um, one of the reasons why we do have some internal kind of struggle emotionally, I think, is in quantifying and examining care work. I agree that it's actually kind of difficult sometimes. That's why one of the things that we're lighting upon is if we can see a kind of how things kind of average out, then that wipes it out for the most part. And if we can see dramatic imbalances, then we can look at that more systemically and it's really important stuff to know because when people overburden themselves with care work in an environment where there's a livelihood that isn't the same as friends and and i think that that is kind of where these these edges blur we need to be as conscious as we possibly can about what types of communities and the hipster nerd comment yeah there's there's a lot of validity to that that's why we're really answering the people who come to us from communities who are outside the hipster nerd stereotype let's say 
that's why a local artisan group, that's why Makerspace in Zimbabwe, that's why Cooperation Jackson were already very uh, capable cooperators who want to try to do things with different uh, principles added. So I would say that our first stab at labs is literally to try to incorporate outside that initial space. And then finally, for people who have, I don't remember if you said um, capacity issues or, or something along those lines, but I think that the, the closest that we can get day by day to explaining this in the simplest uh, format, that's the ideal. And, and we're still striving for that. And the more feedback we can give ourselves, which is part of this dog fooding process, the more we can diagram this out in simpler ways. But because it is a complex system, we're, we're not ready yet, I think, to explain it quickly to someone at a different uh, capacity. But that is a, a good goal. And so, yeah, we're in early stages and I appreciate the, the comments. I'll pass it to anyone else. I have a sort of follow-up question to this, I think, uh, which is if you have seen uh, the solutions as the solution as agnostic in terms of legal entities. And whether if or have when you, when it comes to liability, accountability, guarantees, insurances, pensions, boring stuff like that. If um, if you have thought of that in a, in any spe specific kind of way. I think that legal important as this is a course about cooperatives. Cooperatives give you certain constraints, which to me contrast the strangulation of this planet and its people. Cooperatives force you into several behaviors. Furthermore, I would argue that um, the cooperative structure is by nature an anti-capitalist structure, because instead of wage labor, you don't have wage labor, you have worker ownership. Instead of private means, um, private ownership of the means of production, it is shared ownership. And instead of an exclusive orientation towards profit, you have you know, an orientation maybe towards its membership more than social and environmental ends. And this is where DISCO um, strikes the critique. Um, now, the thing is, is that we need to change the legislations so that co-ops that are doing good environmental and social work are not taxed, you know, for example, in Spain and in many places, if you're a corporate, if you're a big corporation, you're going to get much more tax breaks. So it would be interesting to apply the DISCO model, if you're familiar with the Evergreen and Preston model, where instead of, you know, privatizing health or selling services off to um, big uh, multinationals, we keep it local with co-ops. And, you know, the usual example is there's a hospital in town. Um, do we go to a big industrial laundry or do we go to a co-op that does laundry? Who do we buy the supplies with, et cetera? Who's doing the catering? And I think that the legal form of the co-op has existed, existed for 175 years, but in a political climate that has always, always seen it as, you know, um, oh yes, um, make a co-op, a leftover thing. In the region that Amari, Caitlin, and myself live, there is a very strong cooperative tradition, but they mainly agrarian co-ops. And this is super important because, you know, that's where food comes from. And the deal with DISCO is to make what already works, which is co-ops, more visible. If you were to choose, um, instead of buying stuff through Amazon, you can go out during lockdown. Imagine that you have lots of DISCOs, which are designing globally and producing locally. First of all, um, we don't have to make Mr. Bezos really rich, so the prices would actually go down. Instead of ridiculous shipping and manufacturing in China, we would produce for local needs. And um, whatever, imagine that we have like a 5% on the surplus that we have, and we do that you know, to finance the creation of new discos, et cetera. So legal, from, I will say, however, that for us, it's more important to embody cooperative practices and the cooperative principles, because there's a lot wrong with cooperatives. There are cooperatives demutualizing. There are cooperatives operating like normal market entities. The software that we're developing keeps us accountable more than having a nice poster of the cooperative principles. But out of the forms we have, the cooperative is the best form. We just need to develop the legislation so that other types of cooperatives are recognized and that they're supported. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to say something because um, the co Tom's um, uh, comments were bringing to my mind um, a, a different angle. Yeah, so I was thinking, 
yes, of course. I mean, is this proposition complex as it is because it's not easy to get into and, and it's not easy to practice? W will this be attractive for different types of groups? Yeah, wherever they those those come from, and uh, and um, that that that's a very good question. We we believe it is. Yeah, we believe this caters for. Um, Young people, yeah, that uh, are seeing, are seeing, you know, the lives being, you know, I mean, left, you know, come hopeless. I mean, I don't know if you follow the news in Spain, but at the minute there are riots in a number of uh, cities, yeah, um, protesting uh, freedom of speech, and you know, I mean, there was, you know, sociologists in the television talking about, well, it, does does it surprise anybody? You know, it's very difficult to find you know, way of living, yeah? Talking about livelihood, you know, and the balance between what you believe in and what you can, you know, do for a living. Uh, but we also believe that this can be an alternative for, you know, different types of organizations or groups of people that put purpose and value first and just want to organize themselves in a different matter. Actually, we are uh, we are writing, we are co-writing as a, as a group, a parts of our own experiences in, in you know at, at, you know throughout our working lives and and why have we ended in this group you know I mean we have people here that is 20 something and people in this group that is 60 something so we all have different you know experiences and, and practices and, and we are all very very different and we've come to 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 build this and to want to build this because we we believe it's a it's a practical alternative for different uh, groups. So Tom, I don't know if this answers to your question, but that's what I was thinking when you were talking. And, and um, to an Anne-Marie's point, we, we are making an effort for, for, for making this proposition not only attractive, but translated to something that is it's visually different, so provides visual alternatives to what is, you know, you, you, you see around. Um, tools that can be used by anybody. So it's not being a digital privilege or a nerd or, or you know, being part of the blockchain elite or whatever. We really think that digital technologies can help in a practical way. And, and yeah, I mean, uh, cooperatives are the legal envelope that uh, is there and we need to use and, and we can improve because we can, yeah. The, I mean, this is about, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, pushing the boundaries of of what it's already there. You know, whoever wants to break them is, is you know very welcome. But uh, you know, we want we want this to be an alternative that is real. Yeah. Tan tan tan. Anna, I see I see a couple of hands up, and or Caitlin, you wanted to say something before. Well, I just wanted to go off of that. Um, I think that right now, since we're in such early stages, um, right now we're we're creating uh, the the big picture, the platform for everyone, and we haven't gotten down to the minute details there where we can where we want to do, for example, for the elements, we want to do an audio book so that people who have a hard time reading a lot of text can listen to it and and understand and and really grasp the concepts that we're trying to get out there. Um, so we are trying to make it more amenable, but it's a slow process <laughs> We're only so many people. If there is another question, it, now is the time. And if not, we'll wrap it up. So last chance, people, last chance. Roberto. Uh, okay, I want to make a commentary and hopefully ignite something. Uh, because I, I really like what you guys are doing. Definitely, I've been following you for uh, some time. And uh, I've been uh, reading about it. I was completely excited to have this meeting today. But there is just one single issue that, that I would like to address. And it's about the, uh, let, let me phrase it correctly. I think it, you said feminist care or feminine care. And um, one of the things is that I understand there, there is a, 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 a feminist economy, the, fem, the feminist economy. I don't know if 
if we can think of an economy of caring, but to define that this economy of caring is only feminine, I don't know. I, I would like a model that includes everyone. I think men do care a lot and we do caring things in a different way. The system is developed in a, in a way that we are all in and we're just doing it from different angles. But if we're just trying to move to a, to a better, to better places, and, and I feel a little bit like we are in a bed with a small blanket. And if you pull it to this corner, <laughs> you get your feet outside of the blanket. And if you put your feet inside of the blanket, you leave someone else outside. So it's a little bit, I, I think that's what's happening. Would anybody care to comment on that, please? I think I should be the last person to answer, but um, appearing as a male-bodied person, I will say that feminism has changed me in, in such good ways. Feminism is so good by people of all genders because now um, things are skewed and the power structures that we have and us as cooperatives, we're trying to create a fairer world. And we can see that many of the tendencies which are associated with the unfairness in the world have to do with masculinity. Um, I got really into feminism during the 15N movement. And I'm going to shut up because I talk too much, you know, and that's like one of the male members of Disco. I am overrepresented. But I will give it over to my colleagues or, or Amory. But I can tell you, feminism is for everyone if people take the time to actually read feminist literature. Amory? Hi. Well, I'm going to contrast slightly. Uh, I think what I'll say is that we draw from uh, an area of study that is called feminist economics. So there's a, in other words, there's a body of work and thought under that name. And we didn't name it but it does encapsulate a lot of the values that we think were missing in other forms and that we think does provide a balance in, in ways that we don't see in, in maybe other new technology projects. I don't know that everyone or anyone in my group would necessarily agree, but I also have my own personal opinion that feminism is poised for a change. And the way we describe these things is poised for a change. And I do think that inclusivity is really important. I do think also that we draw on the, the studies and the, um, the forms that best suit our values. And this is what uh, we, we are drawn to now. Although feminist, I also think that uh, there's a lot of things that I observe that are changing in society about how people represent themselves, see themselves, see themselves reflected in others. And there's, there's a lot of change going on in identification and really in, in just the, the ways we think about care. So I appreciate your question. I don't think that it's a, a binary question. Let me put it that way. Thank you. Yeah, just to add to that, um, I think, uh, well, the, there's been like this power of a very masculine, you know, energy in what is our economy at the moment. And um, the feminine, it's just, it's a, it's a way to balance. Uh, so you have, we have this very masculine um, economy at the moment, and we're going into, we want, what we want to do is create a balance here. So it's not that feminist economics are the best, but we need to find a balance between what we have and what's missing. I don't know if that uh, kind of explains things. It's just a balance of energies, so. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that, that was a great uh, end of question. I think it was like a, a very cool way to wrap it up for me. Um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you for that, Roberto. Uh, and thank you everyone. Um, I think it was super nice to have um, it's been an hour and 43 minutes and it feels like we only went in here for an hour. I was just like, oh my God, there's no limitation on time in this group. There's, we're going to be here forever. Um, the thing is, it feels like we're just getting started with the good stuff, right? <laughs> you finished talking, I was like, oh my God, it's so good. We have so much time for questions. And I was like, yeah, you know, exactly. just um, 
So, so yeah, I, I really want to uh, thank you, uh, this co-team for sharing with us and thank everyone for making time in your very uh, crowded agendas uh, for sharing one more afternoon with us or morning, whatever you're standing. Um, this, uh, I'm sorry, like the notification came like late after so much time, but um, I appreciate everyone making it on time, making it uh, so interesting, coming with uh, the smile that you always have on your on your faces, but also the critical comments to to actually build upon what what Sylvia in this case shared with us, because I think that the fact that you you know there's questions to the system is what makes uh, everything build in a in a much more um, you know strong uh, formation. I think so. Thank you so much. Uh, for sharing one more edition, uh, Disco people. And yes, Sylvia, I see your face like this. I'm like, of course. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And also, uh, I did the presentation earlier, but as you see, most of the team is here. <laughs> so I want also <laughs> to thank uh, the rest of the Disco team for being here because uh, as as I was making the presentation, I felt really supported. And I think, as you can see, everyone here is very capable of talking about disco for for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and can I just say, this is the moment that we would go out for drinks and dinner and exactly. continue these conversations in the before times. We'd have the opportunity to really delve into this. So I'm sorry that we have to say goodbye. Another day. Uh, as Sylvia said in that research study, we talk all the time. We talk all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they are super Thanks, approachable. Everyone. They are super approachable. So if someone has, uh, you know, the questions come up after, if you're a, a late uh, thinker or a slower thinker, uh, they are super approachable. They are always super open to to answer questions. So I invite you to keep reflecting and and you know get in touch with with them if possible. And if not me, and I will do the bridge. Uh, yeah, hola. Hello at uh, disco.co is Irene, is the fast woman on the chat. <laughs> uh, so yeah, make sure that uh, you reach out, share your reflections, and um, enjoy your the last day of the week and the weekend. And uh, I'll see you on Tuesday, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your comments. That was great. Bye, everyone. Uh, don't hang up. Why? Yeah. Oh. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.